Hi, I'm Brian Garman, the artistic director and co-founder of Berkshire Opera Festival. In Mozart's Don Giovanni, one of Giovanni's victims, whom he seduces and abandons, is a noble woman named Don Elvira. Now, Elvira has believed everything that Giovanni told her hook, line, and sinker, and she has fallen in love with him and is unable to let go of this love in spite of herself. She's a very complex character, and we're going to discuss her and many other interesting things today with the extremely talented young soprano Joanna Latini, who will be singing the role of Elvira in Berkshire Opera Festival's semi-staged concert version of Don Giovanni this August. Joanna, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. How are you and where are you? I am doing well. I'm in New Jersey right now with family and uh, uh -huh. we're all staying safe. Good, good. Taking it day by day like the rest of us, I assume. Yes, absolutely. And everyone's <laughs> fine and healthy, I hope. Yes, yes, we are all fine and healthy and keeping our, our six feet and spending good. time in the sun. Go oh, yeah, good, it's important. <laughs> So you and I go back a few years now. I'll tell our audience that we met back in 2013, 2014, uh, when I was on an interim gig for one year as the music director of the opera program at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, where you were, I believe, a senior at that time. I was a junior. You were a junior. Ah. Yes, yes, I was ah. a junior. Ah. Oh, th thanks. Thanks for, for the correction. I, I misremembered. Um, one of the productions that year was L'Etoile by Chabrier, and you were singing the role of Princess Laola. And I, I just remember being stunned by your musicality and sensitivity and the exceptional beauty of your voice. So we'll get to Carnegie Mellon, but I want to go back even farther, and I'm hoping you can tell us, when did you realize that you had this amazing voice, and how, how did you decide that you wanted to be a singer? <laughs> Uh, well, I guess, if, how far do you want to go back? I can go back to one of my first piano lessons where uh, my teacher told my mom she can match pitch. And my mom said, okay, great. Keep playing piano. Um, but at that point, no one knew that that was um, a thing that not many kids could do. So I was and able how to old were you at that time? Young, maybe or maybe I started oh, the piano wow. and I could match pitch and sing harmony and one day I accidentally transposed my piece without knowing. Um, and from then I, I joined some choirs and was always very musical growing up. There was always music around. Um, and I was the leads in the musicals, but the real turning point for me was I got an email from Classical Singer magazine, uh, which I had never heard of at the time. I was in high school, I was a junior, mm -hmm. uh, about their national vocal competition. And the first round uh, was at Westminster Choir College, which is very close to where I live. And uh, I think there was even a discount code in there. So I showed it to my mom and she said, sure, why not? Let's go. Uh, so I went and I won the round and I went to New York and sang in their semifinal round. And it was there that a woman from DePaul University heard me and said, why don't you come out to my summer program for a week? and just see what this is like. And at that point, I had never had a voice lesson, and I was just singing. I don't know, singing from the heart, as we always do. But um, I went out and I realized that music was actually something I could study. And she said to me at the end of this, I, I think you have a real chance to do this professionally if, if you choose to do this. And so I got back and at the start of the fall of my senior year of high school, I, I got my first voice teacher and applied to school and uh, ended up landing on Carnegie Mellon. And I saw my first opera after I started an opera program. So <laughs> wow. what was it? Do you remember? Oh, um, I don't know. Is that terrible? <laughs> it's terrible that I don't remember. Oh, but no, not terrible at all. I mean, since then I've seen many, but it's, obviously, but it's just, it really, the bug kind of bit me, and I, I knew music was always in my bones, and something that I really wanted to do. And you went for it, and <laughs> after, after CMU, then uh, where did you end up? Uh, I did my master's at Rice University, so mm -hmm. I went right from CMU to Rice, and then since then, I've done a couple different programs. I was at Santa Fe and Glimmerglass, and I had done Wolf Trap, and Kentucky, and Palm Beach, and have just kind of been out there 
work in it and and singing and doing young artist things and some main stage things and it's kind of it's been a very exciting ride well that's that's great i i'm I'm glad that you bring up uh the young artist training programs because uh, over the past two or three years i know that you've made a very successful transition from your young artist days to fully professional work um now you're starting to enjoy a major career so how has it been for you to navigate this transition that's very difficult for many people, frankly? And what advice might you give to young singers who are just embarking on this journey toward a career in opera? <sighs> wow, I, the journey for everyone is completely different. And I think that's something that's so hard to remember as you're going through it because it's so hard to not compare yourself to everyone around you. Um, but that, that's the same for everyone in any professional life, you know, mm -hmm. but you really kind of have to trust your gut and say, there's a reason I'm on this path. You know, I do feel very fortunate that Ana de Archuleta, my manager kind of, I've been with her for a couple of years now. And something she said to me was, I want to work hard to help you navigate this because I think so many people can get stuck in that kind of nebulous zone between young artists life and you know, main stage life and where do I fit? And right. I think the best thing that you can do is just always be yourself and bring yourself to everything you sing because the only thing that makes you different from someone else is who you are. So as soon as you can figure that out, <laughs> and it's an ongoing journey, but to bring your own stamp to everything is, is important and I think really is the thing that sets you apart from others. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great that you had and have uh, Anna to uh, help you steer steer through this because it yeah. is complicated. There's no one path. No, uh, th there are no rules of how to to make a career in this uh, in this industry. I remember actually um, when I was getting my master's uh, and I, I graduated, I, I said to my my teacher uh, and mentor John Woosman, I said. So what do I do now? Said, I don't <laughs> right. know. That's, that's up to you. I said, well, how, how do I do this? He says, I can't tell you that. There are no rules. So, right. but, well, th thanks for that. Right. Yeah. Very helpful uh, <laughs> advice. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> Joanna, I, I noticed that um, your repertoire is extremely diverse. There's a lot of Handel and Bach. There's a, a large handful of roles in modern operas and premieres. Um, Adina in the, the Elixir of Love, Musetta La Boheme, Gretel, Showboat. Yes, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, do you have a favorite type of music to sing or do you have a desert island composer? That I think is probably the most difficult question that anyone has maybe ever asked me in my whole life because wow, okay. <laughs> um, I am drawn to so many different types of music for different reasons. I think mm -hmm. I love early music because of the freedom that you find within it and how you really can put your stamp on it and say, I wrote this, this is how I feel. This is Joanna in this lens, not a character. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. And contemporary music too. And even musical theater. I think that is so important. I think it's the American sound. And I love singing in English too, which helps. Sure. Um, oh. Maybe, but I think maybe Desert Island composer could be Verdi. Oh, you're a woman after my own heart. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> might be it. I, I mean, but if we could also bring, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein along too, that would be awesome. <laughs> sure, there's, there's room. There's room. There's room? Okay, uh, great. As long as we can have a couple. <laughs> have you sung any Verdi roles yet? But Verdi, not yet. I hope. Hopefully I soon. I hope, I hope, I hope. It's something that I would love to grow into and really make part of my bread and butter mm -hmm. roles. So, mm -hmm. Well, let's shift gears for a moment and talk a bit about Don Elvira. As I mentioned earlier, she's a very complex character. She's sometimes um, played for laughs because she has this habit of always showing up at inopportune yeah. times. <laughs> <laughs> but her music and her text tell us absolutely that she's not a stock comic character. She's also not crazy, uh, but she is really obsessed with this guy, much to her detriment. So wh 
what do you make of all of this? What do you think <laughs> makes Elvira tick? And how do you feel about this character? Well, I will say that when I first looked at the role, I did think, man, she is whiny and annoying and random. Like, how is she always in the right place at the right time? She's always, always uh -huh. there, always right. showing up. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of wild, but alas. I think when I covered the role, too, in the production that Christine McIntyre um, kind of created, the first image of Don Elvira that you see. This was in Palm Beach? Yes, this was in Palm oh. Beach. And this has kind of really stuck with me. The first image of her you see is, she walks out and she kind of has this power pose with like one leg out and she's in this beautiful white tailored suit with a big hat. And I thought, wow, this woman is powerful and beautiful and knows exactly what she's doing and maybe gets lost within her own heart, but always tries to stay on path to what she wants. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can kind of view her text and her journey through that lens, she's not crazy at all. Right. And finding that strength, I, I love Mitra B. I think that has such a turning point. Well, she has many turning points, but the way Mitra did the theme come back three times, I think you can see I've been betrayed by him. I've been betrayed by everyone. And I think the third time is she also feels that she betrayed herself in the uh -huh. way that, how could I get lost? How could I get lost like that and let this man have so much power over me? even though she comes back for one more time and sure. at the end to say, this is it. That, yeah, that's, that's very interesting. And, and Mitradi, uh, for me, I, I think it is, it is perhaps the most moving music in the entire opera. Um, the, the aria and the recitative that, that precedes it. Um, for our viewers, this is an aria that Mozart added for the Vienna premiere of the opera, which was about seven months or so after the original premiere in Prague. And at this point, near the end of the opera, um, Elvira realizes that she's been betrayed and also realizes that there's this group of people who wants to punish Giovanni, to kill him. Mm -hmm. um, so she's torn between her own desire for revenge and the, the love and compassion that she still feels for him. It's just a remarkably uh, poignant and, and uh, affecting moment. So uh, when you have to play a character that is as rich and, and multi-layered as, as this, how do you go about preparing the role, or, or any role for that matter? T tell us about your process. Sure. Uh, well, the first thing I love to do is listen. I listen to a whole host of recordings and kind of go to the piano. I love to play my rep. Um, mm -hmm. It's really important for me to kind of feel it in my hands before to feel it in my body and then feel it in my voice. Um, and then go to the text. I mean, a lot of people will say text first, but I don't know, I just love listening. It, it gets in my sure. ear, it kind of, sure. it fills me, but definitely the text. I mean, read it, you read the libretto, you look at the setting and you say, huh, why did you do it this way? Why not, why not this way? Why is this rhythm like this? And um, also the repeated text. It's, it's very interesting to read and, just really get in there. And every time that you revisit a role or, you know, you could study a role for a long time. And what makes it different? Why do you feel different when you read it at different points in your life? And it's your life experience. And mm -hmm. you get to kind of bring that to something like this. Hopefully, uh, you know, we've not been burned by a man as many times as Elvira has. So hopefully that's not the life experience you're bringing. Yeah. And but keep coming back from more. Yes, I keep coming yeah. back. Right. But um, everyone has felt betrayed or hurt by someone and a situation and a group of people. And you can always bring that to your performances. So trying to be real and bring that truth every time. And what is the truth of the character and what is your truth and how can you wed the two? Yeah, that's, that's, it's, I, I couldn't agree more. And I couldn't agree more uh, about the importance of listening and listening to recordings. I, I think it's, you know, you can see from my, my oh, wall yes. <laughs> of obsolete technology uh, be, behind me. But uh, I, I know sometimes in school and even in training programs, uh, this notion of listening to recordings gets a, a bad rap. Um, I've never really understood why, you know, you hear people say, oh, well, you know, he learned this by listening to a recording. <laughs> it's, it's not like we all just come out of the womb knowing how Traviata goes. Right? Right. <laughs> so, 
so I, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a, a vital part of anybody's preparation. Right. Um, just, but of course there comes a point where you stop listening to find your own sound and interpretation. Indeed. Yes. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. Uh, have you sung Don Elvira before? You mentioned you covered it in Palm, 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 Palm Beach, but is this your first time performing it? This is my first time performing it. Oh, lucky us. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> Uh, thank you. So, uh, to, well, <laughs> thank you for thank you for saying yes. So a little bird tells me, and that's a, a little bird named Instagram, uh, that you've been training for a triathlon. Yes, yes, I have. Um, that was part of the quarantine. Uh, I don't know thing. Yeah, the whole quarantine thing. I it was it was very hard for me uh, in the beginning. I guess it was March thirteenth that everything kind of shut down. Mm -hmm. right? It was a Friday. Mm -hmm. and That Friday morning I had just flown to Louisiana for a Mozart Requiem and I landed, waited an hour before rehearsal, everything was shut down and I, I flew <laughs> home. And it was, I could not find it within myself to be musical for a long time. And so I said, okay, I can't, I can't sit around. I can't be sad. Let's pick a giant goal that has nothing to do with music to just, because mm -hmm. I knew the passion and love and the singing would come back. Sure. Of course. Um, so yeah, I kind of picked this wild goal and I brought my bike out. It was still in a box when I shipped it home from Houston and I've been training. Unfortunately though, the triathlon has been canceled. So oh, I'm I sorry. do a virtual one on my own in the neighborhood or at the Good. Or something, but um, it's been a, it's been a great journey, a test of strength and endurance and that's that's great, but I'm I'm sorry to hear about the cancellation. Of the the New York City Marathon just got canceled last week too. So I know have to wait I another know. year. Hard, uh, hard news. What else keeps you busy when you're not singing? Well, when I'm not singing, I honestly love watching television, and I hate saying that now because oh my gosh, all we've had was time. So I kind of hate it's, it at this moment. It's been a lot of TV <laughs> watching. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I, in general, I I do love great series. Uh, I love trying new foods, creating new cocktails, spending time outside. Really, that's spending time with family is really important to me too. Any favorite TV shows that you've discovered during the past three months? Ooh, I will say I have discovered mm -hmm. Frasier. <laughs> which oh, for is, the first time. For the first time. I've okay. seen random episodes here and there, but I have actually watch the whole series i'm about to finish i'm two episodes away from finishing uh -huh. um i know it's an oldie but really it's a goodie so it was a great <laughs> discovery for me <laughs> <laughs> well joanna our time yeah. is drawing to a close but i am so glad that you could join us today you know in the summer of 2018 the glimmer glass festival was doing jana Czech's opera the cunning little vixen and you were singing the title role of course so i drove up to cooperstown to see the show and you just sang and acted the heck out of it. And I immediately thought, we need to find something for Joanna in the Berkshires. And I'm so glad that we have. So you can all see and hear Joanna as Don Elvira in Berkshire Opera Festival's Don Giovanni with performances on Saturday, August 22nd, Tuesday, August 25th, and Friday, August 28th. Thanks to all of you for watching. And Joanna Latini, thanks for spending some time with us. I'll see you again soon. Yes, thank you so much.